that, that's a pretty fascinating thing about the culture of a program that converts it. That's one of the reasons I was so excited about the idea that he might be able to play for Maranatha soccer because you guys have that kind of chemistry and that culture of a team that really tries to make the most of every individual's uh, toolkit that they bring to the table. Exactly. And we have a we have a pyramid of core beliefs that we adhere to as coaches. And when my dad was on the podcast, I'm I'm sure he at least referenced it. Oh yeah, at, at the yeah. at the very least. So but that, we didn't show it. Yeah, let's, let's uh, if, let's, if we let's can, show let's can let's show, show that. It? Yeah, right. yeah, there it is. So this is what you're alluding to. So your son, when he has been on different teams, there has been a different culture to those teams, and that brings out certain things in his play. Mm-hmm. And I would even go a step farther to say that brings certain things out of him as a person, his his personality, even his his demeanor, his buy in. Yeah. And so we'll, let's just zoom out real quick and we can just talk to the coaches m- maybe listening or the leaders listening and just make sure we know what culture actually is. And the way we understand it is culture is a combination of what you allow and what you expect. And so that is what we try to set as a framework for coaches. So what we allow is shown when we reinforce negative behavior or behavior that does not align with the values of the team. And so the way we do that as here at Maranatha, we have what's called committee. And any, any player listening knows they know who they are that, that have been on the committee. And what the committee is, is if you, if, you viol- if you get out of line in some way, you are placed on committee. And committee is responsible to do any little thing that is undesirable, such as moving goals, washing pennies if they need to be washed, you know, getting <laughs> gear out of the shed. It's just all the little things okay. until, until someone else gets out of line and they get off committee. Uh-huh. Right. So so the committee is always a cycle. And it's we, an opportunity we, to serve the team and reflect upon your <laughs> and, actions. And believe me, we have some <laughs> frequent flyers on committee. <laughs> you know who you are if you're listening to this. So so it's what you allow and it's what you expect. And so what you expect is you reinforce when somebody embodies the values of the team. And we do that with voting on team captains. Team captains, is, uh, the, they're based on this pyramid, not necessarily on who the best player is. Okay. And you'd hope, the, the, you hope they'd be the same. And certainly excellence is on our pyramid, and so it's, a, in, like it's an inherent part of who you are. Um, but we do that by voting on captains according to the pyramid and voting on team awards at the end of the season according to the pyramid. We don't give an offensive MVP here. We don't give a defensive MVP. We give qualities of the heart award, qualities of mind, qualities of action, Odell or Jamie Odell Memorial Leadership Award, Mm -hmm. which is basically the entire pyramid. It's it's a leadership aspect and a process award, which is the foundation. So going back to your son on different teams, Mm -hmm. he has been allowed to be an influence in the way that he should be an influence. Mm -hmm. And it's he brings to the table what he is good at and he is fit on a good team, on a positive culture team. He'll be fit according to his ability, what he has to offer. It's a personal management idea. So if you look at the pyramid, process orientation is the foundation of the pyramid. And so, so yeah, we'll so, put it up larger so that it can be uh, seen clearly here. So process orientation, that, that sounds boring. I thought soccer was supposed to be fun. Process? Process. What's process got to do with it. Process. So yes, we talked about soccer being all about winning. Process is how you manage yourself as a player. So this pyramid is for the player as well as for the team. And so we believe when we say that someone is process oriented, we believe that we evaluate ourselves based on controllable things. Winning is not in your control entirely. You can influence your ability to win, right. but you can't control it because there will always be a better team than you. Um, mm. Unless you're Liverpool, right? Because right. Liverpool's well, the best team in the world. Yeah. Um, so evaluations are based on controllable things. This is what the pyramid says under process orientation. It's the execution of the four pillars of the game, which are technique, tactics, fitness, and psychology, and Christ-likeness. That's how you make evaluations for yourself and for other people if that is what you're tasked with. So as a player, when you self-manage, you're looking at things that are completely under your control. You're not necessarily looking at, do you make the starting 11? Are you all region? Are you all American? Are you a goal scorer? Because those things are influenced by other people. So f- to express your identity as a player, as a person, you reflect on those controllable things. 
and then we have the the pyramid is under the player's control they have the the ability to demonstrate these virtues and to uphold these these values so the cornerstones of the pyramid we have improvement and enthusiasm and for improvement we believe that every situation you're in is an opportunity to improve not a threat to fail so that'll be a player's license to just go for it and to put themselves out there to make right. mistakes to try things they are not currently able to there's do. there's risk and reward that has to be constantly calculated and recalculated in every situation a thousand times or more during a game exactly and you know whether that fullback is going to make a run forward and abandon his defensive position right. in order for right. the possibility of an offensive attack and now burning it back on a counterattack and trying to <laughs> recover <laughs> position. Uh, and you can see some players are more oriented that way versus others. Some are, are better at recovery than others. But those are kind of those individual mm -hmm. uh, decisions that all work together to try and build forward and, you know, put pressure on goal. Exactly. And so you see that as you know sort of part of this thing where you're not going to punish somebody for taking a risk if it was the right risk to take right even if it doesn't r result in a goal R that's that's exactly right and so that block being one of our cornerstones to the pyramid itself is purposeful because we think if you have that in your mindset as a player that every time you step onto the field training game and t like team training and personal training and even in a game every situation is an opportunity for you to improve. So it hopefully will be a motivating idea and it will encourage them to be assertive and take risks, get out of their comfort zone. So that is closely related to enthusiasm, which is the other cornerstone. And you take away the cornerstones and the pyramid falls apart. So we believe that these traits are there for a reason. And if you don't have these traits, none of the, none of the other things are gonna happen. Um, enthusiasm is a passion for the team and for improvement. So we, uh, we connect enthusiasm, which is on the bottom right of the pyramid, to improvement on the bottom left. And we say that if you're not actually bought into this system and this idea, you're not going to fit. Hmm. And so a player that is enthusiastic will demonstrate that in certain ways. They will train on their own if they, if they have the schedule to do it. Obviously, it's not everybody's reality, but they will show up to training early. They will be running from field field to field to get themselves better, save time, all that stuff. And so it's those are key traits of any player in their control that allow them to express themselves and the values of the team in the way that's appropriate for them. All right. And so then on the inside of that first row, you have humility and patience. So, you know, humility and athletics – kind of a stretch fit right like a, a lot of people get into athletics so that they can be celebrated and rewarded personally with achievement right and this brings us to the reality that every block on this pyramid is also it, it's not only a character of christ like this which is a teaser for the top of it um, but it is also a trait of a mentally strong athlete hmm. and so these are where the two correlate and that's where you see god's genius in making his word apply to every area of our life, even, dare we say, a game where you have to kick a ball into a net. <laughs> right. And in a, in, a, in a culture that's highly competitive, because in America we value sports very highly. And therefore, we have a lot of college teams, these players are good. And so these guys that we have here, they're going up against teams in the area that are very good and they have to be mentally strong. So humility, the idea is that you seek what is right and best and not who is right and best. And so that has implications that you are going to do what fits our system as a player, not what fits your own preferences. You're going to let the guy that is better at taking free kicks take the free kicks, not you, right? Mm -hmm. So, And we try to instill that, and that shows itself in certain ways. So humility isn't this deferential, like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm bad. We have this false sense of humility. It's it's people have said it's thinking of yourself less which I think is a great way to look at it mm -hmm. or having an accurate view of yourself which is both are a great way to look at it so if I think I'm the best free kick taker I'm going to put myself on the ball because I think based, maybe I have to ask my coaches am I, am I good? Do you want me on the ball? they will tell me and at Maranatha, we, we are very clear as coaches who we want taking set pieces because we are very clear who we don't want taking, <laughs> taking set pieces <laughs> on sometimes so you have to have that humility to see yourself accurately mm -hmm. And then patience, that block applies for the guys specifically that are either struggling with their game 
or are struggling to get the goals that they want to get, mm. both in literal goals, scoring a goal in a game, and actually goals like making the starting 11 or making all regional American stuff like that, mm. wherever they're or making the team, right? you know, whatever their goal may be. And so those blocks apply there. I, I've been doing the live stream commentary for the soccer team for a few years now. And as we've been able to develop that hardware to make it, make it work out on the soccer <laughs> field. Um, and I have noticed that a lot of our goals come not from beautiful individual efforts, although there have been a few that mm-hmm. you just go, well, that was unassisted. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of our goals come from just team pressure where it just it just constantly builds 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 and all of a sudden it starts to feel inevitable and then the ball's in the net and it, it, it's almost hard for me many times it has been hard for me to even determine who actually touched it last and made it go in the in the net because it's just constant <laughs> until like not all 11 but most of them are right there and then it just it's in the net right and and i think that's a reflection of what you're talking about with this pyramid like everybody is is working together and and building up and doing their job to contain right. and eventually the result is achieved exactly and so that's where it's it's not about who is right and best it's about what is right and best putting the team in the best situation to score and that can mean that can mean anything you know i, th- I know this last year we had a great uh, overtime goal grant kirchner shoots it keeper deflects it up towards the back post and isaac schmidt is crashing into the back yeah. post oh, man. just in case grant misses and isaac has a probably a one foot header that he needed to have to win the game and he he, he got it done and a lot of people thought grant scored I, but we saw yeah, we saw but, that isaac did and but, so he's but doing if his isaac job. decides you know what it's hopeless. I'm not going to make that run. I've made that run eight times already this game and got nothing out of it. I'm just going to hang back and, you know, see what happens, chill, see if I get a rebound. No, he's constantly pushing ahead. He's and going and that tenacity, that determination was, you know, what gave the result in that particular situation. Exactly. All right, so work us up to the next level. So we got initiative, character, and resilience as qualities of the mind. So we talked about those those four, those foundational pieces. We think those are more qualities of the heart. Um and so we transition to qualities of the mind, which is how you really, how you think, imagine that, right? Easy, easy to draw that conclusion. So initiative is that you have courage to improve the situation. And so that may mean speaking up if you have an idea, that may mean collecting the balls because we need balls near the field to keep our time on task high. But you have the freedom and you have the, the authority and the responsibility as a player to improve the situation that exists for you, even in small ways. And so that will show itself in in different ways. Guys seeking coaches out uh, to talk about an off-season training program. How can I get better as a player? Guys seeing that, hey, we have one ball around the grid right now, so let's go and get four balls so we can bring them in so that we don't have to spend time during our work interval to go collect the ball and bring it back. Let's let's try to get better, right? Mm. So that's what that initiative block means. And it's giving them the license to actually take action. They don't have, they shouldn't have to wait for the coaches to say you need to get better. Yeah. I've kind of noticed, uh, coach pill and, and, and when you're out there, other coach pill, um, <laughs> backup coach, pill, <laughs> coach pill Jr. Associate uh, pill, uh, <laughs> you guys are not joysticking, you know, the players out there. Hey, you no. get up forward. That, that's no. a big difference in youth soccer. I mean, the coaches that are usually a dad and we're just like yelling from the sideline, go up here yeah. do this. Yeah. There's a lot of autonomy and trust, I guess, on your part. I see a lot of comments to the other bench players going on like, okay, what was that all about? You know, and I, I've seen <laughs> I've seen your dad ask guys on the bench why a player on the field did what he did. And I'm like, did they text him or how did they text him? <laughs> <laughs> what was he thinking? What was he thinking? <laughs> right. And this, and this is where the pyramid, uh, may, we need to make sure this is also for the coaches. Mm. Because if we don't hold ourselves to this standard, then our enforcement of the standard means nothing. Mm-hmm. And so as with humility as coaches, we think that our end goal as coaches should be to become irrelevant. And so the idea is that we can train them during the week and we can actually join the fans in the stands and watch them, watch them do it. Now, that's, that's not reality. You have to make adjustments on the fly, and that's, that's what we're there for. Um, but we teach the players the principles so that they can self evaluate and Mm -hmm. self-monitor and self-regulate and so that's that's the idea so 
yeah, we want to give players that, that freedom and that autonomy. Absolutely. So we equip them and then we let them fly on their own. There is a, a block here called resilience, and that's not in uh, great abundant supply in our culture right now. No. Are you finding that there's a lot of work that has to be done to help a player become resilient? What is it that builds that character quality? It's it, really as a, as a player, you build resilience by being resilient, which kind of <laughs> sounds funny, but that is a mental skill that you have to practice and you have to learn how not to do it and how, and how to do it. Um, and how to do it is, is a lot more lasting. So that, that is a block for the mindset during the game mm-hmm. and certainly after the game. But we put that in the, in, the, in the pyramid because that is a, in the moment of the game, when I miss the shot that I should make or I miss the play that I should make, I need to be resilient. We focus, we, we say that resilient is just, being resilient is focusing on what you are presently experiencing not the uncontrollable past or future. There's a connection between resilience and what we talk about as being the momentum of a game. Yeah. And when you're on the right side of that momentum, if you feel unstoppable and that's wonderful, but if you're on the wrong side of the momentum, now that's where resilience comes in to try and push that game back the other way and overcome what has now become some adversity in, in this particular contest. Right, right. And what we teach players is that to be resilient, Focus on what is happening right now. Because you're, you're exactly right. It's so hard to overcome the momentum. And if you as a player say, don't think about what that last play was, then it doesn't register in your brain because it doesn't understand the word don't. And we, and we, and we know this. Anybody that's um, studied psychology or sports psychology, if I think don't think of a strawberry, too late. <laughs> right? So we teach them focus on what is right in front of you right now. So if a player comes and they say, how do I correct a mistake? We just say, defend. Because if you made a mistake, odds are the opponent has the ball. So get your confidence back up with your defending. Mm-hmm. And so it's what is going on in front of you at the moment. And it's very, it's very hard. Resilience is a rare trait. And the reality is you are an emotional being and your emotions get affected by negative outcomes. And so resilience well, is Well, it can happen because that. you made a mistake. It yeah. can happen because the other player was just had better skill than you did in right. that particular attack. They right. defended well and dispossessed. Uh, it can happen because of conditions, right? Uh, the field, the weather, the referees, you know, all these <laughs> things. And I, I, I see guys, it happens in the girls game too. I, I see the blood pressure rise and the, you know, we get angry, we get uh, disgusted, we start to blow back and blow up. And, and uh, all of those things are counterproductive to the next thing that needs to happen. What happened right. in the past is irrelevant now. We need right. to move forward ahead to, to address, do the right thing now. Right. And like you said, that's probably defense now. But we always want to try to blame something else for the current conditions rather than just take the conditions as they are and deal with them. Right, right. And, that's, and that is that was what ties the resilience block back to process orientation, our foundation is the player has to be totally focused on what they can control because it, it wastes your energy to focus on those other things. But your default setting is to focus on those other things. That's, that's what makes this hard. If this was all automatic, this wouldn't exist. Yeah. Resilience is not our default setting. No. We have to train ourselves for that. And so that's why we have that in place. It's just, hey, it's, it's going to be a mental battle out there. You got to equip yourself before hand that's why we go through this in preseason before games start we have the players teach this to the players because we believe that what you teach to other people it's easier to learn yourself well it's even harder when you're tired yeah uh when you're maybe nursing an injury you're in pain and you're out in front of everybody exactly i mean you you are being watched by all these people and the pressure is on to perform and you want to succeed and you want to perform and all those things are kind of conspiring against you, even psychologically, emotionally at that moment. Right. And to overcome that and turn things around is a, a pretty unnatural thing to be able to accomplish. And that's why courage never appears here, because it's implied. <laughs> okay. If you are an athlete, you are, that's exactly right. You are putting your failures on display. Now, that's a negative way to view, you know. You I could always also... feel bad as a live stream announcer when bad things happen or we make a mistake and it's like, I feel like I have to say something that it happened, <laughs> but I, I, 
I also know that the players rewatch the games afterwards <laughs> and, and that their mom is probably watching. And so I, what's he saying about me? I, I try to be very gentle, <laughs> but, but it, it, I mean, we wrap our identity into some of these performance Absolutely. things, you know, and this is a very visible deal. So there's a lot that lot goes into that. Absolutely. And that's what you experience too at the higher levels mm-hmm. is by, you know, it's just so understandable that their identity players at the higher level, their identity is more wrapped up in their game because it, it is like it, the high level players, the game is a bigger part of their life. Yeah. And even when you get into the college athletic world, I mean, a lot of people want to be a college athlete and they never get the chance to do it. Mm. So this is a big part of their lives and, and on a year round basis. And so if they're not durable, because resilience kind of speaks to your durability Yep. Um, if they're not durable, they're not going to make it. And so they have to have that way of managing themselves. And the best way to start with that is to be aware of it and to know what it means. All right. So what's the next one? Character in the center. And mm-hmm. this is the block of the summer. We send them away with this after the spring season because character, how we define it, is value what you believe when you're observed or alone, whether it's difficult or easy. Mm-hmm. And so getting up in the morning to do half mile repeats through the summer is not fun. It just isn't. And you can pretend that running is fun. I hate running and I ran for a long time. (laughs) And so you, but you have to do that to prepare for the season. And so we say, if you work out in the summer, that is a tangible way. We can point to that behavior and say, that is someone with character because the coaches don't necessarily know what you've been doing over the summer. We're not, we're not allowed to check up. We're not texting the players every day and saying, Hey, did you get that workout in? You know, we can't do that. And so this is a that's an NCAA thing. It's an NC, yeah. NCAA thing, and so this this is on the player. And so in those early mornings in June, when the season is still two months away, are they going to get up and do the things they need to, need to do to prepare? Now, not everybody can do that because it's summer schedules. But where there's a will, we believe there's a way. What is it you guys say about who will know if you skip a day? The yo-yo test will know. <laughs> and so, uh, so, so that that's for sure. So we we do have accountability. I'm not sure if that was what you're asking. No, well, but if you skip one day, uh, I don't know how the whole the whole saying goes. But if if you oh. skip if you skip one day, only you will know. If you skip two days, then uh, your your coach will know. If you skip three days, your opponent will know. If you skip four days or more, your grandma will know. I mean, everyone <laughs> will know. So yeah, and it is so a, keep it's it going. a private. It's a private choice that ends up with very public consequences. Exactly. I noticed this, not to use my son in every situation, but <laughs> uh, I noticed that before his freshman year, you know, there were some initial emails about, hey, to be prepared for a training camp, you need to be in shape and work out. Right. And, you know, there was some of that late in the summer uh, to get ready. And then there was the season – and then there was the second summer after the freshman year, and it was a whole different summer. Whole ball game different. Yeah, yep. it was like, oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, now he knows. Yeah, and and I think maybe some different results along with that. Exactly, and mm-hmm. so we have a way of testing them when they come back for a preseason uh, day two. It used to be day one, but we know guys have bad travel schedules. Day two, we test their capacity, and we do this in the the yo yo intermittent co- recovery test level one. And that's basically a test where you keep running until you can't run anymore and you have a time to make uh, a certain shuttle distance. So we have a standard for that. Guys have to meet the standard. Right now the standard is 18.5, if anybody knows how the yo-yo test works or you can Google it. Um, And if we believe that they make that standard that they are in a position where they are fit enough to last 90 minutes. Hmm. That's as best we have been able to determine as coaches. We're still always reworking that because it's an imperfect system but it's as close as we can get to it um so we will test them in the yo-yo intermittent recovery test and then we ha- also have a 300 yard shuttle run that they run as a fitness test of their anaerobic capacity so it's basically you know how how hard can you go for roughly a minute mm-hmm. and we'll do that three times obviously there's breaks in between but like we just this is our way of testing what they've been doing over the summer and so the players know that so that is their evaluation and it basically says, what have you done over the summer? And without fail, the guys that have worked the hardest over the summer have the results they usually deserve in terms of how much, how effective they are on the field. Hmm. Now, we don't necessarily use their yo-yo score to determine the starting 11 because you, there's so many more demands of the game besides just fitness. But it tells us a lot about who they are as a person and what they can do as an athlete. 
So what's the next level? What's the love and excellence at the next level in the pyramid? Love and excellence. So this is a pyramid. Yes, we've talked about it being traits of a player, but every block here is biblically backed. So if you look at the pyramid up close, you'll see in the top right corner of each block, there is a scripture reference. And that has close connection. Um, it's it's well, essentially who Christ is. And so love is who Christ is. And so because Christ is God, God is love. And so if we're to do a pyramid that shows who Christ is, who God is, if we leave love or the love idea out of it, then we believe we inaccurately represent his, his nature. And so love shows itself in actions. And so we demonstrate love towards opponents. We play as hard as we can. We're going to try to win every game, but we don't play cheaply. We're not going to get, go out there and kick people and hurt them uh, intentionally because <laughs> we've kicked people and hurt them unintentionally. Um, we demonstrate love towards the referees. We c totally ask questions, you know, have conversations with the officials. That's part of the game, but don't disrespect them. Don't argue with them. You can just present a case. And so we try to enforce that as coaches and we try to model that as coaches as best we can. Um, and then we demonstrate respect towards coaches, abide by and support coaching decisions. And we demonstrate love towards teammates, make each other more effective, which ties back into our humility block at the foundation, which is why it's on the same side going down. And so I <laughs> just want to double check my sources there. Um, <laughs> so, so that's why we have love as a I think a, that's the first time you've actually looked at the pyramid <laughs> and all of this explanation. Just wanted to be extra sure because yeah. that was what it was supposed to be, but just <laughs> want to make sure the, the graphic is right. And then excellence is goes back to a winning culture. The, the idea is to win. Now, we, we say process orientation. We preach that. We say be process oriented because we want to win the game, but we can't control winning. So let's control what we can control and that will influence our ability to win the game. And so... Excellence is just that idea of just we do this in the best way we know how. And it just it's self-explanatory. And if all of these blocks work together, then the very top, the pinnacle, is Christ-likeness, where you repeat some of the same values and you add things like respect and initiative and, and, and all of that character and patience and, and process orientation re results in something spiritual, like Christ-likeness? Yeah. H how does that evidence itself then? Just all of these values together? Every one of these values has a direct correlation to his character, to Christ's character. And so that is the ultimate goal of anything. And so if we put excellence at the top of the pyramid, if we put winning at the top of the pyramid, we lie essentially like we, we cannot use christ-like character to only have the ultimate goal of winning that would be mm. mislaid and that's that's not his design whether therefore you eat or drink whatever you do do all to the glory of god is what governs our mission statement as as believers this is a specific way to do that we want to represent christ on the soccer field so becoming like him needs to be our ultimate goal because we cannot remove soccer from the rest of the Christian life. Yeah, so Jonathan, I mean, we're, we're sitting here talking about soccer, mm -hmm. but the whole time I'm thinking we're not really just talking about soccer, are no, we? No, absolutely Are you not. seeing the same? Well, absolutely. So what's happening here is you're displaying process orientation to soccer, but y we literally see this in your, your work as a communicator for the department too. Like uh, that's what I'm thinking through the, the lens of your process, the, the work that you do to put in, um, the hours on preparation. And, um, I was even thinking about your initiative, the, the time that you spend in the summertime to prepare for the season, right. um, and the character that I'm not checking on you. Coach T is not checking on you, but as soon as the s season starts as a communicator, you've already got your, your stuff set up, you're ready to go. Um, and then obviously there's, there's, uh, there's a way to communicate in a loving way. Um, and there's, there's excellence in performance. There's, there's deadlines, those kinds of things. And as an employee, man, I tell you what, this kind of pyramid is exactly our mission as a school, mm -hmm. right? For our employees and for our students. It, it's, we, we're wanting to produce this in all of our graduates. A lot of companies have a list of core values. 
mm-hmm. that sits in a handbook somewhere that nobody right. looks at and nobody could repeat or know what they are. They never see them in action. They never talk about them. And they really don't fundamentally have any connection between what's written on the page and what mm-hmm. actually goes out the door as their product Absolutely. or their service. Right. And, and so what you're working through is the nuts and bolts of how to put into action you know, something that's obviously very well thought out. You guys have spent a lot of time. And it's probably not the only way to visualize or operationalize these characteristics, but it kind of shows that there's a result in mind, but that that result for the believer goes beyond material success. Right. Exactly. And that's the kind of longer lasting lesson or development that the student athlete at a Christian college or at Maranatha specifically is really benefiting from participation in that team. Your student athletes put in a lot of time and you, you have demands on their schedule and on their life. It's disruptive in so many ways, but are they better off for that? Even if they don't go into soccer as their professional career (laughs) afterwards? We hope we certainly hope so. Yes. And we, and we believe so because this whole model, Exactly. It has, it has a direction. It's not just a list of virtues. And when we, we brainstormed this whole model as a team, the, the team came up with this. And so we have to give them direction. And the, vir- the, the virtues described, the values described, have a foothold in Christ's character, and that applies to every area of life. And so the, the majority, the overwhelming majority of guys that come through are playing soccer at a competitive level for the last time when the whistle blows on the final game of their senior year. So if we don't give them something that they can take away and apply to other areas of life, we've failed as coaches. And that's why we believe that coaching in its essence is discipleship, Mm -hmm. which extends beyond this pyramid and goes more into the coaching philosophy. But absolutely this is, and and we'll communicate that to guys on on a private level, is this will help them become better husbands if that's what God has for them and better dads if that's what God has for them, better employees, better Christians. So what, one of the things that I love about the pyramid uh, is you decided or as you talked about the d- two different sides um, and on the excellence piece near the top, excellence will look different in different stages of life. Excellence will look different in different roles that you play throughout your life in different jobs. And if they can learn all of, all of these uh, descriptors as a process with the end goal of Christ likeness, instead of the end goal of excellence, that makes everything else fall into the correct balance. We Mm. talk a lot about work-life balance. Mm. When you want to talk about player-life balance, (laughs) that's, that's rough. And for college athletes, it's, it's kind of a joke. You know, we talk about that with different majors, with different um, athletic teams that they, they have things out of whack, but it's not out of whack because they have a process in mind. And if the process ends, like you said, with a cup at the end of the season, then everything just stops because they're not going to play professionally. They got the banner, now what? But if yeah. the end is Christ's likeness, they can use that same framework, the same pyramid when they graduate and whether or not they got the cup, now they have a process to move towards life with excellence in a different stage of life. And to me, that's win. That's it, a win. Exactly. And that's why only two blocks on this pyramid have a soccer specific word in their definition. Hmm. And that's why when we say excellence, execute the controllables to the best of your ability. That's how we define it. So that implies that to the best of your ability, Mm -hmm. everybody has a different capacity at the moment because skills can improve. Improvement. Right. And that applies to every area of life. Exactly. And so you could change, you could slightly tweak those two definitions and you truly have a non-soccer specific model. But we're soccer specific, so it behooves us to have soccer specific uh, wording. Exactly. I, I saw this in action earlier this year uh, during the season. I had the chance to travel with the team uh, to Iowa, and we had a back to back. Do you remember that? Yeah. M- remember that time we went to to Iowa? Hey, do you remember that time we went to India? I do remember with that time the, we went with to the India. Soccer time? Team? That was awesome. That could be a whole other podcast right yeah, there. Well, we, Sights and sounds. Time. But yeah. it, was, uh, it was October 7th and 8th. So we had a Friday game against Emmaus, and then we had a, a Saturday game. 
And we had beat Emmaus earlier in the season at our place seven to one. And I think at that point they were they were kind of struggling in the season. And so we saw that Friday game as, you know, one that we probably could kind of kind of pencil in a little bit. Right. And they we we had in the very first part of the game, I wasn't nervous at all. I'm watching that game. We control possession. I don't think the ball was on their half once. Right. And then they countered, and they had that one guy. I don't know what his name is, but he was so fast, and he just got behind the defense and scored. Mm-hmm. And it was like, wait, what? We're losing? <laughs> right, right. And I think then we went down like, I think it was two to one. We end up clawing back a, a, a tie, right? Right. Which was a pretty disappointing tie. I think we ended up tying 3-3 or something like that. Yeah. The next day, we've got to go and play another school in Iowa down the road a little ways, and I mean, I, I saw the guys coming out of the Emmaus game like nervous. All of a sudden, right. like, whoa, what 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 just happened? They were right. a little shell shocked. And even after the game, I heard you talking to one of our captains, and he was like, "The referees, the field, the butt." And you're like, "Hey, hey, control the controllables, right? Right? You can't mess." And, and all of a sudden, on. all the discussion was about these issues on the pyramid. Right. And I saw that in action, and right. it was like. Yep, yep. And I, I saw it almost visually, reorienting the thinking. They stopped questioning. They said, all right, we got to focus because tomorrow is an even, an even tougher test. Right. And, of course, you know, there's there's certain descriptions out on the Internet of the glorious victory that, that uh, inspired, uh, that, that transpired on, on that Saturday, you know, to take away um, – all the cookies, uh, two 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 nil win, and on on that Saturday was it was a huge turnaround. Yes, it was. It was was really more of a, a, a I would say a tougher uh, environment, a tougher uh, opponent, and yet a very different result. Very different result. And if it wasn't for having uh, having values that we look back on, having anchoring points, and things that we will refocus your efforts, we spiral out of control in those ways. And so a 3-3 tie against a team that we beat somewhere along the lines of 7-1 to one, and we've beaten by a bigger margin in the past, mm-hmm. that can be derailing. Yeah. Especially if you feel like the game was a little bit out of your control, the, the, you're blaming referees, the, the field is bad. That can, be, that can make you lose control in your perception. Right. And so you absolutely have to have something that refocuses you and makes you resilient focus on the next on on the present not the uncontrollable past or future all these things tie into making you an effective athlete and so that's that's exactly why this is in place is because it it does it helps you on the field and and it's fun to win it's fun to win exactly we won't lie exactly and that's as good a place (laughs) to end it as always uh thank you for your dedication and commitment i love seeing the success god's given you uh, as you continue to pursue your playing career, uh, although with a wife on the way and life happening, we'll see what happens in the future with that. We will see. Clock's what happens. ticking, buddy. <laughs> but uh, it has been awesome to follow that that progress, and and really thank you for your commitment to the student athletes, uh, the men and the women that you work with, and uh, thank you for your commitment to really all the sports uh, through your your position with the communications aspect of it. You uh, you you strike that balance of making it a big deal without giving people too big a head to become like, oh, I'm, I'm the big man on campus type thing. That's a real balance, isn't it, sometimes in the athletics world? It, it really is. Can't, can't give too much credit. Got to keep them humble, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And, and you do a great job with all of that. Thank you so much. And thank you for your time today. Everything is a privilege and a gift, so it's, it's a pleasure to be on here. Let's do it again sometime. That sounds good. All right. Thank you for joining us today. On Mission is a production of Maranatha Baptist University. Subscribe to On Mission on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Don't forget to leave a review as this will help other growing leaders find these conversations. For information about our guests, previous episodes, and general information about On Mission or MBU, go to mbu.edu slash podcast. Join us again next week as we examine what keeps leaders on mission.